LFP batteries are important for a bunch of reasons, but one of them is that you can make them, at least in theory, anywhere. You can get the minerals, the elements needed to build one just about anywhere, some places easier than others, and that's why we have brought back on uh, John from First Phosphate, CEO and, uh, and one of the major investors in it a guy who knows quite a few things about this topic. We're going to go even deeper. If you missed part one, it is posted. It is in the description below. Uh, but we're going a little bit deeper today, and we're going to start with a crazy one. What is phosphate? Oh, geez. Uh, phosphate is probably uh, one of the most important elements on the periodic table um, to humans, uh, for human life. I mean, phosphate is, 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 is part of, you know, uh, what we need to grow. It's what humans need to grow uh, to keep it simple. It's what plants need to grow. Um, if you look at, you know, fertilizers, all the fertilizers out there are on the basis of, of phosphate because phosphate is, is essential uh, to life. It's essential to our biology. Um, you could read millions of papers on this, but that's about as simple as I can make it. That's great. And in the battery, what is it taking the place of compared to an NMC battery? What is it replacing? The nickel, the manganese, the cobalt, all of it? Yeah. So as we talked on your last, uh, on the last episode that we did, Brian, so they're both lithium ion batteries. That's NMC and LFP. Um, the only thing is uh, LFP is got the L in front of it. So it's LFP, lithium iron phosphate. And then NMC, for some reason, they don't put the L in front, but you could very easily call it the LNMC. And then if you took out the, the two Ls on both sides, you'd be left with NMC on the one side and an FP on the other side. So nickel manganese cobalt equals iron phosphate or iron phosphate equals the replacement for nickel manganese cobalt. Um, both batteries are valid. Both batteries have their, um, their niches and will continue to have their niches. Uh, but iron phosphate batteries, um, you know, ha have specific qualities that we discussed on, on the, on the last, uh, show, which was basically, you know, uh, they're generally, uh, uh, less expensive chemistry. They have uh, better uh, stability in terms of uh, thermal runway. Um, and they're also becoming, uh, you know, the, the lead batteries out there, um, not only in EVs, but especially in energy storage and in small devices. They've really carved out, you know, the majority of the market in very short time in the last uh, few years. And they've been around for about uh, 20 years, really. Started in North America, good old North American technology, perfected by the Chinese and now hopefully coming back to North America. Now, worth mentioning, uh, we both know that there are, in fact, hundreds of chemistries of batteries that are viable. But for the sake of the discussion, we're talking about the two types most common in automotive uses. So, uh, and really in, in most applications, the other ones are specialized for other things. We're not going to be discussing those. We're really talking about LFP. Uh, phosphate, uh, phosphate comes in a few different forms, uh, igneous, for example, sedimentary. Uh, what are the different types and why? Do, I mean, does it matter? Yeah, so maybe the, let's let's try to keep this really, really simple. So phosphate, the element is P, mm -hmm. but as you know, most elements do not appear on their own in nature. They appear all jumbled up and then humans got to take them and rework them and try to split them up and get them down to the state that they don't want to be in, right? Uh, and then use them and make things out of them and keep those things stable. Um, so P is, is phosphate. Um, now, when you have phosphate and fertilizer, there's a certain chemical formula um, I won't go into, but it's got, you know, it's got hydrogen, it's got phosphate, it's, it's got uh, um, sulfur, um, it also have potash, nitrogen, uh, it's a very complex formula. When you have uh, phosphate that goes into uh, LFP batteries, um, it's 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 uh, it's much much more simple formula, and it's really the the phosphate together with the oxygen uh, that gets bound uh, to the iron um, in 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 the cathode. Now, in before you get to that, you have to have it in what's called purified phosphoric acid, which is generally something. Are you ready for this? It's called H three PO four. So you know three uh, hydrogens, uh, P, and then uh, four four oxygens. Generally, what you do is you when you mix that with the iron, you you kick out the H, and you're really left with the uh, with the with the with the the P and the O, and you bound it together with the F with the Fe, and then that creates iron phosphate, and then iron phosphate is bound with uh, lithium, all of stuff which in the in in nature does not want to really go to but together, so you have to do that you know um, sort of surgically if you will through chemistry, and then you end up with lithium iron iron phosphate cathode active material. Is that a good okay. uh, simple answer? <laughs> um Yes, yes, I think that's uh, as simple as it can be. Apologies if uh, 
If that's not simple enough, we're doing our best here. So yeah. a question is, why is it that when it comes in rock form, it's better for cars? Yeah. So, okay. So, you know, now and that's maybe where I forgot to elaborate and let me do that now. So phosphate generally, um, in phosphate ore, phosphate rock, phosphate as produced by mother nature, um, which is not the form that we wanted as humans, right? Because we have to meld it into fertilizers or meld it into phosphoric acid to put it into food or to put it into batteries. So you have sedimentary phosphate rock, which is generally sandy loam. It's old sort of swamp beds. Um, you know, if you go into Florida area, North Carolina, South Carolina, it's kind of old seabeds. If you go into Morocco, it's old seabeds. And that's kind of sandy, loamy stuff. Lots of dinosaur bones found in it sometimes. Um, lots of cadmium, uranium, thorium, lots of nasty kind of other uh, elements in there. Um, but then you also find it in a very, very rare form. Um, and it's only in a few cases of the world we find it in volcanic form. It somehow got caught up in volcanic activity and it's just there fairly pure. It still needs to be separated, but it doesn't have all those nasties in it. It doesn't have the cadmium, the uranium, the thorium in it. Sometimes it can have rare earths in it and that kind of kills it. It's difficult to separate. So what we're, what we're really looking to do is phosphate um, that comes from um, basically the uh, sedimentary world, which is a sandy loam stuff, that's got a lot of impurities. So they usually take that, they attack it with sulfuric acid and they get merchant grade phosphoric acid, which is a phosphoric acid um, uh, based on phosphate and water, but it's got lots of impurities in it. But it's not a bad thing because you just throw that onto uh, farm fields. Um, the, the P, the phosphate is released and it helps plants grow and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the nasties just stay on, on, on the ground, but those nasties are already part of, of the, of, of the uh, they're not really nasties or what you don't need is already part of the farm fields. Um, the nasties kind of go out in the, in the gypsum slag piles um, from when you attack with sulfuric acid. And that's a big problem. The gypsum slag piles in North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, there's a hundred of them. They're a big environmental issue. So you use the same process when you take the igneous rock, you, you, you react that with sulfuric acid, but what you get out the other side is pure gypsum because the, the, the phosphate in there is relatively clean. It doesn't have the cadmium, uranium, thorium. So you get clean gypsum, so you don't have slag piles. You can take that gypsum, you can make plaster, and you can make uh, prefabricated homes, a number of other things that are made out of gypsum. But what you get is you get purified phosphoric acid almost immediately. 90% um, of that feedstock, if not 95, turns immediately into purified phosphoric acid, which is a direct route into technology, right? Into what is needed to make LFP battery. Whereas with the other uh, sedimentary stock, uh, usually over 50 to 80% of that has to go into agriculture and only a small portion can be skimmed off the top. Think about it like when you're curding cheese or something, you just want what's coming off the top and then all the other stuff is not so pure at the bottom that goes into the fertilizer world. But when we do use this igneous rock that we have only in Quebec, uh, the igneous anorthosite, which is the purest in the world, we get this up to a 41% pure phosphate, which in the world of phosphate is, is the highest out there. That goes directly into making battery grade purified phosphoric acid. And quite frankly, it's what we need to get um, production of LFP battery here in North America, because we do not even have enough phosphate for agriculture for fertilizer that's going to be decreasing by 61 percent by 2037 they say so we're going to be at a massive import imbalance uh, with morocco who's got all the reserves that's already becoming a political problematic issue so we need a we need a source of phosphate that can make a lot of purified phosphoric acid that goes direct in the battery and one that doesn't interrupt agriculture so boom uh, we got this deposit there in uh, in in uh in Saguenay, Lac Saint Jean, Quebec, that can make 350 gigawatt hours of battery. That's half of all the automobiles produced per annum uh, in North America, being you know Canada, U.S., and, and Mexico. Um, and uh, that's just off of one deposit. So it's it's an incredible source of uh, phosphate, pure, clean, uh, green. Um, that goes directly into battery. It's it's almost a a a, a miracle come true uh, from the chemistry and the the geological world. And I'm sorry for that long, uh, <laughs> long no. explanation, but it's about as short as I can make it. Well, this is something you're excited about and you know quite well. I don't know if it's because your answers are so good or my questions are so good, but my next question was literally: your process converts 90% to automotive grade battery. The other 10% becomes what? Agricultural. The other 10% is mixed in. It's uh, in uh, with uh, um, with uh, gypsum sulfuric acid, and, and we've got a little bit of a special uh, kind of chemistry coming up, and it goes into farm fields. Yeah, so it's so pure that it, 
So you don't, you have a very little, um, there, there's always a little bit of, you know, slags and stuff coming off of these processes, but it's, it's minimal. It's minimal in terms of what the alternative process for the, uh, the sandy loam kind of sedimentary stuff does to the planet, which we can't get away from, or, or there'll be starvation on the planet. But this process is perfect for batteries because batteries, you want them clean, right? You know, if you look at the way some of the, the, the batteries are being produced right now, and I won't say where, um, you wonder if there's really a benefit to the earth, right? Um, but this will provide that benefit and it, it will do so in an economical uh, way. And we're replaced there in the Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean area of Quebec. We're within 50 kilometers at the mine, the processing facilities, and the rail and and the shipment by by uh, by uh, by vessel as well. We're right close into the NATO base. It's it's an incredible positioning to have the best footprint and the most economic price and really uh, be able to to really ramp up uh, the need for purified phosphoric acid for these batteries uh, in in North America and bring it back home. Right, that's what we all want. I think at the end of the day. And then my next question was, uh, and the byproduct is, uh, I put drywall, but you're saying no, just more like mud, really, but a usable product that can actually be sold. Yeah, if you remember, I don't know if we've all seen the pictures of the guys making uh, the David and uh, the other plaster sculptures in Europe. That's exactly what it is. It's, it comes out like a, like a mucky white mud, but like I said, it's, it's pure, it's clean. Like if you're, if you were to start a gypsum mine and you, you, to get to that purity, you would have to already purify regular gypsum once, twice, maybe three times to get to that purity. So it comes out of this massive ultimate purity for making uh, plaster for walls like they use in Europe. They still use plaster, which they use more drywall here in North America, but you can make it into modular housing. You can shape it into anything. It's almost like plastic, if you will, once it dries, it's solid. Yeah. Well, it has the same root word in it, but yeah, it is uh, formable. So the big thing that you were saying is we want to get we want to shorten the supply chain. We want to get it all done. Uh, I don't know if folks know this, but Mexico currently has zero lithium mines. The U.S. currently has one lithium mine. One. We have a bunch that are in various stages of permitting. They are not permitted. They are not producing lithium yet. They are not extracting it. Canada has a bunch of lithium mines, and they've got this phosphate uh, deposit that we were just talking about. And you've got graphite. You've got companies up there making exceptional graphite. It sounds like uh, right here in North America, in Canada, you've got all the pieces you need. Uh, the, the remainder would be aluminum and iron and, uh, and whatever you decide to put it all inside of. And then glue, I guess. I assume you have glue. Uh, You've got all the pieces. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, obviously, Brian, I think, you know, um, we do done just to, to, to comment on that, you know, making a battery um, has got a lot of components to it. Um, and we have issues with every single component uh, just about in North America. Uh, there's people trying to onshore as, as much of this as possible. Um, but we're focused on our on our on the one spot, which is the cathode active material. So, you know, if you look at some of the um, uh, sort of agreements that were to be had between, for instance, let's look at CATL and Ford um, or some of these other ones. Those were, were meant to source the, the cathode active material from China. There was no plan, I don't think, to source that, that cathode active material here locally. So it was really about taking a lot of you know components from China and from, I guess, elsewhere, but mostly China, importing them here, assembling it here, and making the battery here. So you're making the battery here, but the components to the battery would still be made you know, abroad and mostly in China. So we're part of that sort of level two where you start to say, okay, well, now let's make the components in, 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 uh, in, in North America too, the componentry of the battery. Well, what's the most important component? Well, it is, it is the cathode. Uh, it is the anode by, by weight, by bulk, uh, by sheer mass. But you're right, the foils, um, the, the enclosures, um, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, electrical components, a number of the, of the other components in the battery, which I don't even know what they all are. There could be, you know, 20 to 50 of these. All of that has to be on shore too, but we're just doing our part. And our part is is quite a sizable part, which is the cam. You know, you, you can't get anywhere without the cam. Um, so that's uh, it's sizable, and it's the raw materials, right? You're beholden to these raw materials. Even China's going to be running out of uh, phosphate for for LFP battery by 2030. There's already huge problems over there in terms of the phosphate competing with uh, the food supply. Um, and the phosphate that they're using is is the sedimentary phosphate, and they have to crack it. They have to heat it up, and they have to use these very environmentally deleterious processes to get to the uh, phosphate um, because it's not pure enough. Um, but we can get to that immediately through this igneous rock 
without all the environmental implications um, and we can become self-sufficient, um, at least as regards the, the, the cathode active material. So the last question we have for today's installment, because we got to rush along to get to the final third and final one and get you out on time, is how recyclable is the phosphate and how much of it is even in the battery? Yeah, so the, the phosphate, as you know, it's it's an element of life. So it's not it's not toxic. It's a matter of, you know, it will be a matter of getting it out of, of the battery and recycling it. Uh, iron phosphate in and of itself, um, could potentially um, be mixed in with other agricultural products and returned to the earth in, in, in some way or another. I don't profess to be an expert on this. There's a lot of studies out on it. We haven't had enough uh, LFP batteries in North America that have come to the end of life to need to have to do this. The, the problem is going to start soon, uh, but the, uh, China already has this, this problem. They had a lot of LFP out there for a long time and they, they, are, they, they do have solutions from my understanding. Um, to this. And there are also other possible solutions in, in agriculture that have never even been thought of because fundamentally iron and uh, and um, and phosphate are what you see in farm fields. When you go to a farm field and it's all red, like if you go down to Argentina, places like that, you get into red earth, that, that's the iron uh, that's making that, that, that earth red. And phosphate is already going into fertilizer. So there's definitely going to be ways to, um, to, to recycle this and it's non-toxic um, on its own. So you know, element by element. So this is this that's wonderful news for, for the LFP battery as well. Yeah. Okay, guys, what did we miss? What do we misunderstand? Please come back in a day or two when we run part three of this, which will go all the way deeper still, and we will get all the good information. Like, subscribe, pretty please subscribe. I'm trying to hit a hundred thousand this year. It would be a tremendous help. And everybody else, stay tuned, stay juicy, and I cannot wait to hear from you clever robots in part three.